Acts is such a, a wonderful book of the Bible. It, you know, it tells the story of, of the New Testament church, how it began, and it's just rich. Um, we're we're going to cover a big portion of scripture today. No way that I can possibly uh, preach all that. This, this could literally be like 10 sermons, um, and I'm not even kidding. So I'm going to read it, though, so that we have the context, and I'm going to focus in on the end. Um, So this is Peter uh, at Pentecost, standing up, preaching uh, his first sermon. Something absolutely amazing just happened. Uh, God poured out his his Holy Spirit on, on his people, the 120, and a supernatural event took place. Uh, a sound of a, a, a great wind uh, that the, the story says. And, and then these uh, tongues of fire, that's not normal, uh, resting on, on uh, the people's heads. And they were able to speak in foreign languages. They're all Galileans. And there's people there from, from all over the Roman Empire, Jews that had been dispersed that all spoke different languages And they were there hearing the mighty works of God being spoken by these Galileans in their own language. Like, it's incredible. I don't even know how that happened. That's why it's supernatural. Uh, And supernatural events are are meant to to get our attention, to say, oh, that's not normal. What's going on here? Um, And so that's that's what we're wondering. And now Peter is going to to stand up, and Luke records this, uh, and to give an explanation of what all this means. So let's, let's consider um, this, this sermon uh, preached by Peter. Uh, it's the cliff notes, thankfully, uh, but it's still long. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning our reading in verse 14. Uh, friends, this is God's word, and it says this. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem... Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on your male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made him known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers and sisters, I say to you with confidence that the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would see one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, 
nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers and sisters, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Woo! When are reading there? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your word that we just heard and read. We thank you, Lord, that it's, it's trustworthy and true that, that you have preserved it in such a way over the centuries that it is your word without error and that contains your revelation, your revealed truth to us. So we pray that you would help us to understand it. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through it. Would you do that for our good and for your glory? We pray these things through Christ. Amen. One summer night, way back in 1993, I was in my room at my parents' house reading through the Bible. It was the first time in my life that I ever read through uh, the scriptures uh, for myself. And I, was, I had a little uh, blue Gideon New Testament. I was reading through the Gospels, and one night, one night, something happened. You see, I, I had not been happy. I was not happy. My, my life was, was going in the wrong direction, and that one night, I felt the weight of my sin. I felt the weight of my sin. I was, I was reading uh, about Jesus. I, I was reading about uh, the miracles that he did. I, I was reading about uh, him going to the cross. And I finally realized, by the grace of God, that he did that for me. He did that for me. That, that if I wouldn't have been a sinner, if I, if I hadn't had messed up, if, if I hadn't lived my life according to the way that I wanted to live it, if I wasn't a person that was in need of forgiveness, Jesus would have never had to go to the cross. It was my sin that held him there. 
Have you ever felt the weight of your sin? Have you ever considered that it was our sin that held Jesus to the cross? We, we are reading here a, a sermon that, that Peter preached. And, and it says in verse 37, as, as those that were, were listening in on this sermon, that they were cut to the heart. That they felt something. These people, quite literally, many of these people were in that crowd, in that courtyard that yelled, crucify him. You realize that? This is in Jerusalem. It's, it's those people that were there that yelled, crucify him to Pontius Pilate. And then he was crucified. And then he died. And then he was put in a tomb. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. And people saw him. It says for 40 days, he bore witness of himself. Many of these people, I would bet, saw him. They saw him die. They saw him risen from the dead. And now they're being confronted by Peter. And they are cut to the heart. Quite literally, they feel like they are responsible for Jesus' death that he was crucified because of them. And none of us were there. At least I don't think so, right? But isn't it true it's our sin that, that held him there? When you realize that, something happens to your heart. Cut to the heart. That summer night in 1993, I was cut to the heart. And just like these people who ask, what shall we do? Like, what do we do with that? And maybe you're asking that question this morning. What do you do with that? When you realize that it's your sin that, that held them there. Jesus, in verse 36, it says that he is both the Lord and the Christ, or the Messiah. Well, Peter tells them, he tells us what we do. We repent. We, we repent. Because Jesus is, is both... Lord and Christ, when, when we are cut to the heart, when we finally realize that it was our sin that held him there, we repent. And everybody has the opportunity to repent. Everybody who has been cut to the heart, it says in Joel's prophecy in verse 21 that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter your education level, how much money you make or don't make. Everyone has the opportunity to repent. And it's here that we're, we're, we're considering our original repentance. That there are some of us that have been following Jesus for quite a long time. But the text here is pointing us back to perhaps that summer night, if you have that in your story. 
that original time when you decided to follow Christ, to repent, to, to turn away from living for self and to turn toward living for God. What shall we do? We repent. And what does that actually look like is what the text here tells us and reveals to us. You see, a person who repents gets baptized. A person who repents receives the Holy Spirit and the person who repents devotes themselves to the church. That's what they do. They, they get baptized. It says over 3,000 souls, right? 3,000 people were baptized that day. They were active. They, they responded. Baptism. What is it? Well, if you've never seen a baptism before, you may need to know what baptism is. It's when a pastor either dunks you in water and brings you up because you'll drown if he doesn't. Baptism is when a pastor will pour water on you. Or, or, or baptism is, is when a, a pastor will sprinkle you with water. Those are usually the three modes that happen. What's important? Water. It's, it's the water that is important. It's that symbol. What, what does that symbol of water mean? Well, we know because we all probably took showers this morning, right? Water cleanses, takes away dirt. That's the, the, the function of, of water in this baptism, symbolically meaning that that water will wash away our sin. So it makes wonderful sense that, that people who are cut to the heart, who realize that it's their sin that held Jesus to the cross, he's dying for their sin. We're dying because they sin that they would get baptized and say that this outward Reality is reflecting the inward reality of the heart. That we have been forgiven. Forgiveness is wonderful, isn't it? If you've ever felt the weight of your sin, the call here is to be relieved of that weight, of that guilt, of that shame. And baptism expresses that inward reality that we are forgiven. Do you remember your baptism if you've been baptized? Do you remember that? Maybe you were a, an infant when you were baptized. Or, or maybe you were like me that, that one summer day when I repented and that summer got baptized. I was, I was immersed. I was dunked in, in a pool of water by a pastor. Baptism, if you just pause to, to think about what it means, is it's the forgiveness of sins, but, but, but aren't we declaring, isn't it being expressed that when we're baptized, that all of our past sins are forgiven, right? All of our present sins are forgiven, and, and all of our future sins are forgiven because of the shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross. Like, like that's the, the one moment in, in our, our spiritual journey in, in which we're declaring all of our sins are forgiven, are washed away 
because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. The baptism does, doesn't save us. The baptism doesn't cleanse us from our sin, but it, it points us to the one who did save us and who did forgive all of our sins. So the timing, if you think about it, the timing of the baptism is not the point. You, you may have been baptized as, as a child, right? But when you come to the place where you, where you own the faith for yourself, where, where you declare that, that, that Jesus died on the cross in your place, when, when you are cut to the heart, when you decide to follow Jesus, you can look back to your baptism and say, that, that was the symbol, that was the sign that, that God was faithful to me to bring me to this point where I have trusted in Christ and in Christ alone for my salvation. I'm going to follow him. That his work forgave all of my sin. Or maybe it, you were like me, that, that one summer night I came together. I had a moment in which I said, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to stop living for myself. I'm going to start living for God. That Jesus gave his life for me, and now I'm going to give my life back to him as a response of gratitude. I'm going to get baptized. I look to that as an anchor for my faith. To remember, man, there was a time. There was a time when God was clearly at work in my life. And I repented. And I got baptized. And that baptism reminds me of the perfect work of Jesus on the cross for me that I am forgiven of all my sins. So if you have come to the, the, the place in your journey in, in which you are trusting that Jesus died on the cross for you, be baptized. If, if you've already been baptized, I'd invite us to remember our baptism. Do you remember way back when God was at work in your life? And he brought you out of spiritual death and the spiritual life. That in that one moment, there's just a great image of the cross and what Jesus did for you and for me. He forgave us. That weight that we carry has been relieved by the work of Jesus. Be baptized. Re remember your baptism. You do that actively. But there's also a, a passive thing that happens when we repent. And that's we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit. And, and I think it, in, in a wonderful way, baptism can symbolize that as well. Especially if you pour. That's why I like the pouring. I'm a pourer when I baptize. I mean, the prophet Joel said, I'm going to pour out my spirit, right? I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. And I think that's a, that's a wonderful imagery. That what, what does the water represent? I mean, doesn't the water represent? And baptism represent the spirit, right? I'm going to pour out my spirit. It's just a great, great imagery. Remember JVK when he was down here? We baptized him, that water, all that water, just from above being poured down into him. It's a wonderful image of receiving the Holy Spirit. You see that? That? Outward reality is, 
is expressing a heart, our inward reality that, that when we place our faith in Jesus, he pours out his spirit on us. Or to better say it, he pours his spirit into us. And why does he do that? Well, he does that to, to help us to believe that we belong. We finally belong to God. We belong to, to God, and, and he calls us to be his witnesses. He's giving us everything. He's giving us himself to empower us to, to do what he has called us to do, which is to be his witnesses. That's an inward reality expressed through the pouring out of water and baptism. It reminds me of, of you know, the, the, the wonderful thing uh, hospitals in our wonderful city do when, when uh, children are, are born, newborns, you know. They're wrapped in the, the terrible towel. Th th that's, that's just absolutely phenomenal. I, I don't know the history of that and how that came to be, but it's, it's wonderful. And, and what does it mean when, when these babies are burritoed up in that terrible towel? Well, it means that they belong. That they, they are a part of the team. They're, they're stealers. Every single one of them. And, 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 and what are, are they given? They're, they're given everything that they need to, to, to be on the team because they're going to end up either in their living rooms or, or going to, you know, the stadium which, once that gets all straightened out to, to, to take that towel and to wave it with all their might because the Steelers need help. Like, they need people to be waving the towels. Those people belong. You know, they're stealers. They're on the team. Their job is to wave the towels at the games and to cheer on the team, to, to be witnesses. All right, I, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm stretching this, but I think there's a parallel. Well, when we're given the Spirit of God because we've placed our faith in Christ and we're baptized, we're, we're given everything that we need to belong. Like, we know what team we're on. We're on God's team. And we're empowered by His Spirit to be His witnesses. That's why we're given the Spirit of God. We have everything that we need. See, repentance leads us to that. That, that original Repentance, you know, it's, it's something that, that we receive, by the way. It's, 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 it's passive. It's given to us. We don't have to go out and seek it. We don't have to beg God for it. But he gives it to us. We belong. And we're empowered to be his witnesses. So you ready for a difficult question? But why are we not baptizing more people? Why are we not baptizing more people? What's, what's the disconnect? I was in a presbytery meeting yesterday on Zoom. And I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but, but in our entire denomination, or in our presbytery, I can't remember, each church this past year had one adult baptism on average and, and if you if you look through the the statistics it is actually just a handful of churches that had a lot of baptisms it, it, if we're God's people and he's given us his his spirit which is what this text is saying I'm asking myself where's the disconnect are we not being witnesses? Are we, are we not out there developing relationships with, with people who, who don't yet know Christ? 
Or, or maybe we don't feel like we're equipped to share our faith. Like maybe we have those relationships and we just don't feel like, you know, we have the ability to, to tell people the, the good news of the gospel. I mean, that, that might be it. But I think that we should be challenged by that. That, that our, the, the heartbeat, right, of the church is to be the witness of, of Jesus, of his sufferings, of his death, of his resurrection, of the, the message that forgiveness of sins is, is, can be found through, through him. That people that, that we know, men and women, boys and girls, don't need to carry that weight of their sin. That Jesus died for them. So that they could be made into a right relationship, belong, and have purpose and meaning. We're forgiven. We, we belong. That's what it means to, to repent of our sins. And finally, we are devoted. To, to, to repent of, of your sin and, and, to, and to turn and to live for God produces a, a devotion. And that's what we see in verses 41 and 42. 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. And what did they do with their time? Verse 42 says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. You, you notice the word the or the that's there. In, in the Greek, it's, it's, it just jumps out. There, there's a, that's called a definite article. There's a, there's a, th this means something. These are these four categories of, 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 of activity that, that this group of people were devoted to. And we can guess what they mean. The, the apostles' teaching and fellowship is, is something like we're doing right now. That, that, that the people would gather together and, and to be taught the scriptures. And then the breaking of bread. It's very clear that that, that is, is the Lord's Supper. It's not that they just got together and and hung out and ate together, although they certainly did that. But this, the breaking of bread, it's a formal title. This is the Lord's Supper. They would celebrate that together. And what else would they do? What else were they devoted to do? They were devoted to pray together. The heart of the church, to pray. And they didn't have to do these things they wanted to isn't there just a huge difference between wanting to do something and having to do something if that's even a word want to versus have to it's valentine's day right there's a big difference guys between wanting to get your wife flowers and feeling like you have to. If you feel like you have to, it may be time to slow down, gather some people who love you together and work through that because that's not healthy. But when you want to, Right? We say, oh, to be young again. Right? But when you want to do something, I mean, your, your, your wife knows. They know. They'll tell you too. But how much so with God? I mean, you know what I'm saying? How much so with God? These are the, these are the activities, the, the practical steps that that people take when they repent. 
Like they, they make their church life ju just as important as every other area of their life, if not more. And they don't do it because they have to. They do it because they want to. So if we're just keeping it real right now, I mean, wh wh where is your heart at with that? Are you doing things in our church? Are you, is your participation a, a have to? Or, or is it a want to? Because I think we have to just be honest with ourselves. If it's, if it's not a want to, it's really time to, to consider, why, why is it that I feel like I have to do these things? And, and I think maybe the a, a good first step and an encouragement to our hearts, if that's where we're at, is to consider yet again the forgiveness of God. The forgiveness of God. That Jesus, because he loved you, and because he wanted to, it says with the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross and he sacrificed himself so that you and I could be belong, to be in a right relationship with God, to spend everlasting life in a new heaven and a new earth without sin. Maybe we need to go back there because forgiveness. And God freely giving himself to us by pouring out the Holy Spirit into us. It's those things that empower us to be devoted, to want to do the things that God's people did here in the early church. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, if you've never been baptized, let me just encourage you to do that. To, to, uh, to embrace Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. And let us know. We'd be happy. Wouldn't we be happy? Would we not be happy to baptize you like right here next week? But, you know, if you find yourself in the have-tos, it's time to address that. It's time to, to go back to the forgiveness that Jesus has secured for you on the cross. Maybe God is cutting at our hearts today. And if he is... Let's repent. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we just come with a, a heart of confession this morning. A heart, Lord, that that knows that we have fallen so short of, of your glory, of your, of your standard. You, you, God, have given us the gift of life. And, and we have so often taken that gift and used it, Lord, for our personal advantage and gain. But Father, when we consider that Jesus hung on a cross and that it's our sin that held him there, Father, our hearts break. Lord, if we've never trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we do so now. 
And Father, if, if that is something that we have done, oh Lord, we just give you praise for our baptism. That, that event, that symbol, Lord, that just points us to the wonderful cross where all of our sin was covered by the blood of Christ. And we're happy, Lord, to continue in a spirit of repentance of when we realize, Lord, that we are no longer living for you by the things that we say or the our thoughts or our actions, Lord, we are just so happy that you don't give up on us. We're so thankful, Lord, that you simply call us to confess that to you and to turn back to you by saying the things that we should say, by thinking the things that we should think, by doing the things that you've called us to do. So Father, here are our silent prayers to you as we confess and we, and we repent and we once again go back to the cross where all our sin is forgiven. Friends, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.